as a Christian, have you given any thought as to what does God want us to do? What does he want me to do? How do I conduct myself as a Christian? How do I live as a Christian? How do I live as a Christian boss? How do I live as a Christian worker? How do I live as a Christian doctor, father, mother? How do I do it? What, what does God want me to do? Is there somewhere in the Bible where I can get just some clear instructions on what does God want from me? Well, guess what? There is. We're going to take a look at Micah chapter 6 to find some answers and some guidance to those questions. Stay tuned. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Thank you for tuning in to the New Life Bible Church YouTube channel. My name is Minister Wallace. Uh, and on behalf of my pastor, Palin, Pastor Alan S. McLaughlin, and First Lady uh, Dr. Norma McLaughlin, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the New Life Bible Church YouTube channel. We are in Fayetteville, North Carolina, right outside of uh, the, the largest military installation on the planet, Fort Liberty, North Car Car Carolina. Uh, if you're ever in the area, in the Fayetteville area, Rayford area, or even Hope Mills area, uh, we would ask that if you got some time to drop by and join us on our Sunday services. Uh, we do a live and in-person Sunday service, 1030 a.m. And we also do what you are seeing now, a premiere video and or a live streaming video on Sundays at 830 uh, in the morning. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to jump right in. You've seen the title. It's probably made you think, hmm, where is this going? Well, I can let you know exactly where it's going. We're trying to answer the question, and I think many of us want to know the answers. <laughs> many Christians, we want to know the answers to what somewhat are simple questions. What does God want from us? What, how do I conduct myself? How am I supposed to live? How do I live a Christian life? Is, do, how do I, do I suppose, am I supposed to act like a pastor? Do I act like a deacon? Do I act like, I mean, what is, what am I supposed to do? What kind of clear guidance is there? Well, guess what? Within God's word, there's absolutely uh, clear guidance. Uh, with, within the Bible, we have to note that the Bible doesn't have every answer to every question. Uh, I don't want to get thrown out of any Christian uh, Facebook groups. But the Bible isn't the only thing that you need. Uh, uh, the Bible is, has a huge amount of guidance. But in your Christian life, there's other things that you need too. I'm not saying that the Bible is not important, but there's no math in the Bible. There's no social studies in the Bible. Uh, there's no business investment, resume classes, so on and so forth. So we kind of misspeak if we say, this is all I need. Well, no. For your Christian life, absolutely. For guidance in doing all those things, absolutely. For, for you who have given your life to Christ, that is your guidebook on your conduct and how you should conduct yourself as a Christian. Now, in studying your other things outside of your the Bible, the Bible has specific instructions on how we conduct ourselves. And some of that we're going to get to today. So in Micah chapter 6, the prophet Micah was having a similar issue. Uh, because we know that God's word is progressively revealed, we know that the Old Testament people, in a sense, were getting to know God. Uh, the children of Israel, they had, I mean, they were like us in a sense. They were, well, more so in a sense, they were trying to get to understand how they were supposed to conduct themselves. Now they were, yes, they were busy making a whole bunch of mistakes. Well, the prophet Micah, as with most prophets at that time, uh, well, all prophets at that time, was charged with relaying God's message uh, uh, to his people. A prophet is basically a conduit for God. Think of the conduit that's all throughout your house. Uh, well, sometimes you don't have, uh, so in commercial buildings, you may have conduit pipe, uh, and that's where the wires travel through. If you think of conduit as in con conducting electricity, uh, the prophet was the wire. Uh, that, that was how God transmitted his message directly from heaven to his people. And Micah's message was simple. 
We're going to be in Micah chapter 6. His message was pretty clear, and it was also echoing a lot of the prophets at, at the time. Look, he was telling them, you need to repent and change their ways and turn towards God. And he also, Micah was one of the few, because Micah is like a mini Isaiah. Micah was one of the few who was speaking of a coming shepherd king. Now, Old Testament times, they didn't know what that was. But again, because the Bible is progressively revealed, they didn't know what, who this shepherd king was that Micah was alluding to. We won't see it in chapter 6, but just giving you some context of the entire book of Micah, uh, he was alluding to a coming shepherd king. Well, we know, we know because God's word is progressively revealed, we know that that shepherd king is Jesus Christ. So mainly what, where we're going to focus on is that Michael was trying to give instructions to the people of what they needed to do in order to how they should conduct themselves in order to please God. You see, their thought process was, well, if we mess up, they understood the ritualistic um, sacrificial system. Their thought process was, well, if, well, if we mess up or we do something wrong or we go get a lamb or two and go get some grain or something, we burn it, uh, sacrifice it, and we good, right? We can keep it moving. Michael was like, no, yes, the sacrificial system was a thing in the Old Testament, but what God wanted in the Old Testament is no different than what God truly wanted in the New Testament. And what he wanted was, is he wanted his people to change their actions and their attitudes. The sacrificial system was simply a reminder. It wasn't, it wasn't that God wanted these ritualistic tributes, um, and it wasn't that you are not, you are not buying God out, right? You can't just go, oh, if I do something wrong, hey, here's uh, six lambs, two cows, and uh, 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 uh. okay. No, no. What God really wanted was behavior change and attitude change. So we understand this, I think. Uh, uh, reprimands have been paid uh, many, many times. Uh, we see there are, I'm looking at a few examples on my uh, screen here. Reparation has been paid a few times. There are many folks over the United States, we won't get into the details of it, but there's uh, thousands of people across the United States over the course of time that have been wrongly accused. There is a, uh, uh, a huge case. I'll talk more about it probably at the 1030 service. But this man, uh, John Jerome White, he went to jail uh, when he was 19 years old and did 40 years, wrongfully convicted. Now, they gave him some money, but really... I mean, of course, the money holds accountability. We got that. That's great. But I bet you, if you ask Mr. Jones what he really wanted, and I think he mentioned it in the uh, words that he had, he really wanted the system to change, change the behavior. Reparation is, I won't say it's great. I know, don't throw me off the bus. But I think what we really want is behavior change. Well, that's what God wants. That's what Micah is relaying to his people from God, that God is not so much interested in your sacrifices. He's interested in your behavior change. So what we're going to look at is from Micah chapter 6. We're going to look at three. Three pretty clear uh, directives that come from God uh, uh, to make the point that God does not, he's not looking for uh, uh, ritualistic tributes from us because those can tend to be a burden too. And sometimes they don't mean a lot. Now we're talking Old Testament times. This is what God had called them to do, but he had called them to do those things in order to remind them to change your behavior. So we won't say it doesn't matter, but we will say that God's point was is that he wanted behavior change, just like Mr. Adams. Of course, the money is great, but I would think he wants his 40 years back. He would rather have not spent that 40 years and or, or to never have anybody else to be wrongfully convicted. So it's not that we want to be paid back or given some type of handout. That's not what God wants. That's not what you want either. Really, you want behavior change, attitude change. So we're going to take a look at Micah chapter 6, and it's going to give us three fantastic things that we can do 
uh, to, to that, that we can do to please God no matter where we are. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we come before you, God, to give you all praise and honor and glory. In your Son's name, we ask, God, that you bless this word, bless the people that's hearing. In your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Micah chapter 6, uh, sacrifice was not an entry fee to God. Sacrifice was not something that you, you that, that, well, I'm going to sacrifice my way in. No, that's not, that, that's not the way it, it, it works. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, one of the fundamental truths, truths that go throughout the Bible is that God wants behavior change from obedience. Behavior change is and was the goal. The advent of the Levitical law, for those of you who understand the law, the 613 laws that, and, and all the things, all of that was to drive behavior change. From Noah's Ark to Jonah to the advent of Christ to the writing of the Pauline epistles to the rise of the church and the tribulation period, at the, at the core of all of those, God is requesting, advocating for, prompting, pushing, or, or judging behavior change. Behavior change is one of the premier uh, uh, goals within the biblical text. So today, we're going to ask what, what God wants us to do. No matter who we are, no matter what status we hold in our lives, no matter where we're from, no matter what we look like, no matter who we vote for, no matter what, what profession it is. I'm talking from biggest pastor in the nation to, to the guy who sweeps the baseball floors, whoever it is, God is not looking for sacrifice or payment. God doesn't want reparation. He wants change. Listen what, to what the prophet Micah says in Micah 6, uh, verses 6 through 8. He says, now, this is the, the context of this conversation, because we're jumping into it. The context of this conversation is Micah is speaking for, as a prophet did in the time, he's speaking for God. He's relaying this message from God to the people. He's also relaying the people's request to God. So this is Micah talking to God and responding for what God says. So Micah is saying to God, now I want you to notice how Micah tends to get more and more, not sarcastic, but begins to exaggerate more and more trying to make the point. He starts off in verse six, chapter six, verse six. He says, he's talking to God. He says, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yelling calves? And then he goes on, he steps it up a notch, kind of exaggerating a little, little. He says, does the Lord take pleasure in thousands of rams? First, he started off with one. He said, well, do you take, do you take pleasure in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for all my wrongdoings, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, verses 7, Micah is getting, he, he's, he's not angry, but he's trying to make the point. So if it's sacrifices you want, shall I just give more and more and more and more? So that, that's a valid question. I mean, if I do more, should I just give more? At first he talks about burnt offerings and then he steps it all the way up. And then, and then the answer comes from God in verse eight. And this is where we're going to hover to get our three uh, points. God says, he has told you more. Well, this is Micah speaking for God. Micah says, he has told you, mortal one, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And that brings us to our first one. The first thing that we need to do, that, that we need to un understand, that God wants us to do, is to change how we or how I interact with people. In Micah 6, 8, it says, the, one of the first thing that God says, I want you to act justly. I want you to do justice. In other words, I want you to be fair in dealing with others. Well, justice is a quality. Basically, it's the quality of being just, but we can't define a word by using the word within the definition. So it's, 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 it's the ability to be impartial or fair, uh, conformity to a principle, an ideal. is closely linked to righteousness. God says, I want you to act justly. In the original text, he said, I want you to do justice. Listen to what, what this, uh, I, I, I don't know who wrote, wrote this, but it says, justice has to do with conduct in relation to others. 
Just behavior accords with what is morally right and fair. Justice is a quality of doing right. So in order to act justly, in order to do what God, what, what Micah is saying from God, in order for us to act justly, we must change the way that we interact with people. Listen to Isaiah uh, 1, 16 through 17. It says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil, learn to do good, seek justice. So Isaiah is saying, seek justice. God is saying, do justice, act justly. Both are the same. One is tell telling you to seek it out. To, you need to look to do good. You have to change the way you interact with people. Listen, we, we, we have to change the way that we interact with people in order for us to do justice or to act justly. The second one comes from the very next line in the same portion of text from Micah 6, 8. The next thing that we need to do is we need to change how we relate to other folks change how we relate to other folks. The first one, change how we interact with folks. And then this one is, 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 is more so, we need to change how we relate to other people. Micah 6, 8 says, Micah is saying from God that the next thing he says, to love kindness. God says, I want you to act justly and to love kindness. He's directing us, you need to love mercy. You need to love kindness. You need to love carrying through on your commitment to meet others' need. You need to love that. So, so in order to learn to love kindness, we must change how we relate to other folks. If your whole lifestyle right now is you are walking around, as we said in a few messages ago, if you're walking around locked and loaded, you just ready to hate somebody. Oh, look, look, look. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. He think he's some, somebody. Oh, look, 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 look. I can tell you what. I know he don't like my, my kind over here. Oh, look, 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 look. I bet you he won on them folks that, look, stop. You know how that feels. You walk in a store or some, somewhere. Oh, look, look. He can't afford to be being here. They must, they must be stealing. Well, why would you flip the script? And then, oh, oh look, look, look. Satan got us all playing the same game against each other, and all of us is losing. There are no winners. We have to change the way that we relate to other people if, if we plan to fulfill what God is directing for us to love kindness. Instead, we need to seek to find common interests with other folks. We need to listen to other folks more often. Not waiting to talk, but we need to listen to what other folks have to say more often. Often. We need to try to use empathy. In other words, we need to try when we are relating to other folks, try to be empathetic. What does that mean? Try to put yourself in their shoes. My grandma used, used to say, you walk a mile in my shoes. That's empathetic. Think about my struggles. Think about, think about their struggles. What, now you can't, you can't know it, but you could if you listen. Maybe if you ask her questions, but if you have already judged the book by its cover and you're probably mostly wrong, or you could be right, <laughs> who, who knows? That's not your task. Your task is to love kindness. If you don't and you choose to walk around locked and loaded, I'm going to tell you what, it's going to result in a lot of stress and you're going to keep a lot of doctors happy and you should have a whole cabinet of little pills, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because you're stressed out trying to hate everybody. Listen to Colossians 3, 23 through 24. The Bible says, whatever you do, whatever you do, Whatever you do, <laughs> do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it, it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. In order to learn to love kindness, we must change the way that we relate to folks. We must change the way we relate to people. Also, and finally, from the same portion of text, but the last thing that Michael relays from God is that we must change our attitude about life. I must change my attitude about life. Listen to the last portion of that text again. It says that, that Micah is saying that God says, 
walk humbly with your God. Do justice, love kindness. And the last thing he says is walk humbly with your God. Fellowship, modesty. This one speaks to the manner in which you and I do things, how we conduct ourselves, how we act, how we live, how we talk, those types of things to walk humbly with your, with your God. So in order to walk humbly with God, we must change our attitude about life. I have to. I can't walk humbly with God if my attitude about life is all kind of chopped up. I got all these different... Uh, typically media fed views or friend fed, Uncle Ray Ray fed, uh, newspaper, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, live stream, submarine, whatever it is, stuff just bouncing around in my mind and it changes the way I think about the world. Well, the way I think about the world, and I'm when I'm talking about the world, I'm talking about the same sense that the Bible talks about the world, it's systems. If I think they're out to get me or everybody's hunting me down or, or I, can't, I just can't do this and I can't do that, they don't like me and they do this and they do this, that they group gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The problem with that again, as we said earlier, Satan got us all playing this game and nobody's winning. All of us are losing. All of us are losing. But he got us convinced that he's after you and you after him and you need to get him, you need to be ahead of him. And we're walking around in a sense, again, to repeat a past point, we're walking around locked and loaded. Also, in this sense, the way Micah used it to, to uh, walk humbly, or is a, 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 to walk circumspectly. This is an old phrase that used to be used, a pastor needs to be circumspect in his behavior. What, 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 what that means, and that was a good, because pastors, ministers, leaders are examples. Uh, so to walk, to to live wisely, morally, cautiously. Our Christian life should be of, uh, of, of, of faith and praise, soberness, simplicity. So soberness meaning more than just not getting drunk, but soberness and meaning being, being the things above, being kind, thinking things through, uh, hearing folks out, not be so quick to make a judgment. Soberness carries with the quality that you are thinking things through. So in order to walk humbly, we must change our attitude. And if circumspectly, walking circumspectly with Christ is a better word for you, well then do that. But either way, in order to walk humbly, we must change our ad -ad 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 attitude about Christ. We have to remember as believers, we are called to be different. Uh, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're set apart. You're different. You are called to be different. Now, yeah, at your government workplace, like myself, you got to figure that out, but it's not hard. You can be different within the rules of the government. Being different don't mean that I got to wear a Christ shirt. I got to have a Bible in, in, in your face. And this and that. That doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that. If you take away those rules, you can't have your Bible at work. You can't say Christ at work. Okay, guess what? This is saying Christ. All this should be saying Christ. The way that I do my reports, the way, the way that I hire, the way that I fire, the way that I conduct myself, the way that I talk to my boss, the way, way that I talk to his, his boss, the way that I talk to my employees. That, that's, that's Christ. You can write Christ. That's why we don't have to get stressed out about, oh, you can't, you can't do this and, okay, and that at work. Well, well and are you at work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you a representative of Christ? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's called a mole. That's called a mole or a spy. Whatever term you want to put, put it in, that's called a Trojan horse. You're an insider. You're an insider. Christ has got an insider in a place that they don't want Christ to be. And they didn't hire, 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 hire you. We don't want. You have to change your outlook on life. You just have to change your outlook on life. Listen, we are called to be different. First Peter 2, 9. Listen to what it says. Peter is saying, look, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Ding, royalty. I told you royalty, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who, who, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Psalms 3 echoes the same thing. And we could go on and on and on. So Psalms 3 says, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly person for himself. The Lord hears when you call, call him. So how are we set apart? How are we called to walk humbly, to be different? Well, our obedience to God's commandments 
ought to be evident in our behaviors and relationships. I can't tell you enough. So what to your rules? So what to your rules? That, you know what? So what to your rule that I can't pray at, 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 uh, uh, or we can't have a 10 commandments? So what? So what? I work there. I work there. You done let the Ten Commandments in the building in a living form. Take them off the wall. No problem. I still work here. Fine. Roger, thanks. You know what? No problem with that. Guess what? I'm going to live those. Uh, we have to have that attitude. We have to change our attitude. I must be able to see the value in God's Word. I must seek to understand his word. I must make Christ Lord in my life, meaning Lord, meaning he's got to be the lead in my life. In other words, things funnel through him. They funnel through him. What does that mean? Well, they funnel through his word. They funnel through his word. What should I do? How should I, this resume board, how should I run this resume board? Well, you should run it respectfully, hum humbly, honestly, justly right? That's how you should run it. No, no Christian, uh, you don't run the resume review board by picking out the folks who you know. They ain't qualified, but you you know them. That's not what God is called calling you to do. Well, you know how they, they do. God ain't, God ain't worried about that. He's worried about you. He's worried about you. What are you doing? So you run that board. You run your hiring. You, you build the building. You I don't care what you're doing, sweeping the floors, wiping, cleaning, nursing, whatever it is, the scripture says, whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever it is, do it to honor God. We must apply that in our lives to walk humbly. So how do we have an attitude change? Matthew 18, Jesus uses a child. They ask him, what's the greatest, how do we, how do we get into heaven? Uh, what can we do? What quality should I have? Jesus said, uh, Ray, uh, Mikey, come here for a second. He called the kid, kid over. I don't know the kid's name. I gave, gave him a name. He called the little kid over. He said in Matthew 18, 4, Christ said, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in heaven. Wow. And you think about it, humbles himself like a child. It's no wonder that Christ will use a child as an example because a child's attitude on life, one of the reasons he uses a child, a child's ad, ad, ad attitude and outlook on life is, is, is bright. I don't care where a child is, and I'm talking young, young child, I don't care where a young, young child is, their attitude on life is bright. I spent some time in West Africa. Uh, in two, 2000. It was with the army. We were doing there, doing some stuff. But this was probably in an economic sense, one of the most impoverished places on the planet. But I got video because I used to sit when I had time, time off and I would record the kids. Now these kids are playing in what many of you would call a dangerous wasteland. I mean, it's bicycle rims and glass and stuff broken, open sewage. But if you close your eyes and play that recording, all you hear is laughter, giggling, chasing each other, the same things you would hear at the playground on Lake Rim, the same things you would hear at Six Flags, because kids, so it's no wonder that Christ used them as an example. But what happens is, as kids, between our parents and the world, it takes many years, because as a kid, you believe you can do anything. You, you believe you can fly, you can be Superman, you believe you can be the bad, bad man, you, you, you believe you, you can be a doctor, president, you, you believe it. You believe it, there's nothing wrong with that. But what happens to us? Well, not to be sad, but what happens to us, it takes many, many years of many, many adults pouring water on those dreams. You can't be no so-and-so. You know they ain't gonna hire nobody like you. You can't do that. You ain't even from that place. They only do this and that. You can't do that. You, you, many of us, look, I've done it. I've made that mistake. Many of us are, are just really just dumping water on the fires of our kids. I'm not transferring this into kids, but Christ pulled a kid over and saying, if you had an attitude like him, if you had an attitude like this child, that is, you would be first in the kingdom. So we need to know that we, if we are going to, if, if we are going to uh, do what God wants us to do, <clears throat> we need to act justly. In other words, we need to change how we interact with folks. If we are going to love kindness, 
then we need to change how we relate to folks. And if we are going to walk humbly with God, we got to change our attitude about life. These are not just good to do things. This is not self-help. The Bible is giving you some pretty clear instructions on what God wants, what he wants for you. And guess what? This is great for you. It could be self-help. It could be, but it's not. This is fantastic for you. And like we said last Sunday, this is true for everybody, everywhere, all the time. Everybody. This, you could save yourself thousands on therapy or whatever. I'm not saying it's bad. I think therapy is good, but you could save yourself thousands. These are simple truths. Apply these in your life. De-stress your life. Don't walk around locked and loaded. Micah is trying to relate to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. God is basically wants you to act justly, love kindness, and walk humbly with your Lord. I'm relaying that to you. I would, I would propose that you apply that to your life and try it and try it out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you, God, for all the blessings in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless. Have a good rest of the day.